Ey olan tüm halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı. Ne fazla ne az. Can I feel it that that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. A lot of killers. Why do you think our country so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello and welcome to Varm Block. And today I'm with Joel Rainwhite, one of the co-authors of Climate Leviathan. And today we're being, going to be talking about how climate change is likely to affect our uh, I guess, geopolitical f formations. And um, I wanted to start by just breaking down the four broad categories that you set out in the book, because I think if you don't understand that, you're not going to understand this conversation. So what are the four kind of broad trajectories that we could be dealing with according to uh, uh, your man's book? Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, thanks for having me on, Varn. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> so, Varn, candidly, in my experience, attempts to try and explain the four trajectories via videos like this uh, tends to be, I think, difficult for people because you, it really helps to have that visual along with it. So uh, how about instead of going through the four scenarios, uh, if I talk about the two, um, the two conditions that are shaping our future, because I think that's maybe the better place to start. Let's start with capitalism. Uh, I suspect that all of your viewers are uh, familiar with the idea that, and perhaps may adhere to it themselves, that, that for some fundamental reasons, capitalism is set against the planet, against uh, livable conditions on our earth. Capitalism is an inherently expansionary, accumulation-oriented social formation. And so there's fundamental ways in which capitalism requires the transformation of the planet. And everybody who looks at the environmental situation in the world today can see that the world is in really dire shape. And of course, the most serious problem we face is planetary climate change, which has major consequences for all species on Earth, not just humans, but most especially for poor people and people who are coming in the future. So consequently, we on the left have settled around the idea that to come back to your quote from Kotsky, which was on the screen a moment ago, Essentially, we have to either deal with climate change, which means confronting capitalism, or we're going to end up in some kind of barbaric future scenario. And most discussions about climate change, I would say on the left, end up falling back in discussions about how do we transcend capitalism? And if we can't, what does that mean? So that's one of the two ways in which Jeff and I take up this question in our book, Climate Leviathan. Uh, we, we want to contribute to the discussion about the future of capitalism and climate change. But we want to add to that conversation by complementing the debates about capitalism with another discussion, which concerns the political theory of the future form of government or governance in the world. And here our argument, to put it simply, is that the world is undergoing the beginning of a political transformation in the form of sovereignty, in the form of sovereignty. And what we're going to see in the course of the future, we predict, it's a hypothesis, we may be wrong, but what we expect to see is that a changing form of sovereignty whereby capitalism comes to be organized under what we call planetary sovereignty. And planetary sovereignty would be a condition characterized by a change on one hand in the scale of operation of government, whereby essentially the planning and management of capitalism on a world scale would be achieved or realized by some kind of mechanisms for governance. And on the other hand, a shift as well in terms of the ideology or hegemony through which sovereignty is justified to one where saving life on earth comes to be the paramount 
mode of justification or a way of winning hegemony. So if you accept that these two conditions or qualities are significant, namely we're either going to have a capitalist future or we won't, and we're either going to see the emergence of planetary sovereignty or we won't, then it's pretty clear to see that we have a two by two set of possibilities. So the book in its essence tries to sketch out four possibilities, essentially all four combinations of possible futures. And we try and explain why we think the most likely scenario, which incidentally is not the one we're cheering for, a point that has been lost, I'm, af I'm afraid, on many readers and which, of course, we are to blame for. If we didn't make this clear enough, it's our fault as writers. But uh, what we think is most likely is not what we're cheering for. What's most likely is what we call climate leviathan, hence the, the title of the book. And climate leviathan is a, is a pathway, a future scenario. It's not a thing. It's not an object. It's a future. And it's a future scenario in which capitalism persists. In other words, we on the left fail to overcome and transcend capitalism in the short to medium term. Indeed, the world becomes more capitalist in this scenario. In, that would be our expectation, which has been the historical trajectory. Things becoming more and more fully capitalist over time. But that capitalism adapts to the crisis presented by climate change by developing or, as we put it, adapting to a new mode of political sovereignty, namely planetary sovereignty. So that's the central claim or thesis of the book, which, again, it may be right or it may be wrong. The better part of the book is explaining, is, is, is given over to explaining what that means, why we believe that, uh, providing evidence insofar as we have it from the present status quo. And then in the end, we sketch some alternatives uh, to climate leviathan. I, Varn, I hope that's good enough for now. I'm happy to go through all the scenarios, but perhaps we can start there. Yeah, let's start there and let's start with uh, maybe the, the scenarios will make more sense as they come up organically. Sounds good. Um, so what kind of policies do you see emerging out of climate leviathan? Um, uh, you talk a little bit about uh, green, quote, unquote, Keynesianism, um, the, the presence of the World Bank and maybe the United Nations, um, and then things like things that are normally pushed by liberals in America, such as uh, global carbon markets, offsets, etc. Uh, what what do you see this doing to the international order? And if in your most likely scenario? Great, great question. Thank you, Varn. So as you mentioned, I think it's safe to say that most people who regard themselves as progressives in places like the US or New Zealand or Canada support some version of what is commonly called a Green New Deal or green growth. And the basic idea here is that we want to keep capitalism, but tweak it somehow so that it actually becomes more sustainable. In fact, this is kind of liberal common sense. In one of the chapters of the book, we analyze this tendency and we, we, we rename it. We call it green Keynesianism on the grounds that in all of its manifestations, these are variations on ideas that owe a great deal to the political economist John Maynard Keynes, who was not only one of the most important economists of the 20th century, but we argue created essentially the basic matrix through which a lot of so-called progressives or liberals today confront all kinds of problems about crisis. So whenever we have crisis type problems, people become Keynesian, whether they, whether they know it or not. And global, global climate change is most definitely one of these. So what we find, if we look at what elites around the world are saying these days about climate change, is Keynesian type thinking. Essentially, they want to regulate global capitalism to make it more amenable to the climate crisis. And there's a few basic mechanisms by which they can do so. You've already mentioned some of them. But this is only one means by which we can imagine the emergence of a planetary sovereign. Uh, because if you think about it, but let me explain that. I just took a little leap. So let me explain that bridge a little more carefully. Uh, because typically when people talk about things like the Green New Deal here in the U.S., where I'm, I'm in Ohio, when people talk about Green New Deal, they almost in, invariably imagine it operating at the scale of the territorial nation state. Like the U.S. will have a Green New Deal. Canada will have a Green New Deal. Maybe Mexico will have a Green New Deal and so on. And in Korea, they used to speak of green growth under the Lee Min Bak government. You, you, you mm -hmm. may remember that. So these ideas have been around for some time. After 2008 to 2009, when there was the great economic crisis and there were discussions about how to kickstart the global capitalist economy again, 
there were a lot of very wealthy people who were proposing to do so by means of reorganizing finance, energy production and consumption around the world through a kind of global green plan that would stimulate global capitalism while also exploiting uh, possibilities for new forms of investments. And it's easy to see why these ideas are attractive because they solve multiple problems at once. They, they help deal with the big planetary crisis of climate change, which is very serious and which to generalize elites understand is a real problem. And on the other hand, uh, they deal with the need for a solution to the so-called realization crisis, getting another round of accumulation going. So what Jeff and I point out is that if you look at all of these ideas, there's a, a fundamental political element that tends to be missing, which is that they actually only work on either side, either to resolve the realization crisis or to deal with climate change if they're scaled up to encompass the entire world. They, they have to operate at that scale because capitalism is a global phenomenon, and so too is climate change. And this point has been noted by many political scientists and indeed many of the people who write about these problems will often say at some point, and of course, to, to really make this work, it would have to scale up to the whole world. So our question is this, what happens if we start with that proposition and ask, okay, if it has to become global in order to work, what does that really mean? It means that there's going to have to be at some point a adaptation of the form of government so that there can be global mechanisms to regulate global capitalism. And if we recall the attitude or ethos of the elite after World War II, we can remember that we've seen this before because you know, after World War II coming out of the Great Depression and the, the two great wars, the perspective of many global elites, certainly not all of them, was that actually global capitalism needed global institutions to regulate it for its own safety, for the sake of civilization. And that was of course the peak of Keynes's influence and when he could lay out a vision of a global architecture for regulating capitalism. And we see variations on this theme today where essentially it involves taking the old ideas about disciplining capital and reorganizing production and consumption on a global scale, but now with a green tint. So at the risk of, at the risk of saying something that sounds perhaps contradictory, let me just clarify something here. Jeff and I are not therefore opposed to all of our friends who support Green New Deals. We fully understand that in the here and now, in places like the United States, where we can't even get a Green New Deal right now through Congress, arguing for a Green New Deal makes sense. But as, as, as scholars who have also a commitment to honestly and thoroughly confronting the crisis of our times, we also feel an obligation to point out that sometimes what we want isn't really going to solve our problems. And we have to be honest about that, particularly on the left, because otherwise we end up in situations where we end up arguing for things we don't really want. And then we end up in historical situations that are untenable. Uh, I, I have one more thing to say in response to your question, but if you'd like to jump in. No, no, this is, this. Uh, but let's, let's do the last point first. Okay, so the, the in your, in your, in your original, excellent question, Varn, you were saying, but you know, how do you see climate Leviathan coming about? And my response so far has only focused on what we might call to follow the standard language, the economic part, although it's also political. But, but finance and economics is only one reason why we can imagine something like planetary sovereignty emerging. There are other logics pointing in the same direction. Immigration, for instance, or the weapons race. Uh, there's a scholar at my university named Alex Went who's written brilliantly on what he calls the, tel the telos of world government. And his perspective is written exclusively from the vantage of the logic of the global arms race. Uh, there's another reason though, another uh, element to this, which I would, which Jeff and I would add to the table, which concerns geoengineering. And this is a big discussion and we don't have a lot of time, so I'll try and keep this brief. But there's a lot of discussion, particularly among elites and scientists these days, about what is typically now called geoengineering or attempts to kind of reverse engineer the planet's climate in the event that we cannot quickly reduce carbon emissions. So without going into all the details, I think most of your readers are aware that climate change is driven by changes in the Earth's atmosphere, principally through the burning of fossil fuels, also through land use and cover changes. And that essentially we're made, we, humans have made, through the burning of fossil fuels, relatively modest changes in the atmosphere 
taking the total CO2 equivalent from around 250 parts per million 500 years ago to 425 or so today. And it continues to go up very quickly. And what we really need to do is bring that carbon that's in the atmosphere down as quickly as possible. And there's essentially one way to do that, which is to stop burning fossil fuels. Hence the all important call, leave the fossil fuels in the crust of the earth. That's the crucial point. But among elites and scientists who watch these issues, many of them are skeptical that it's going to happen. And they're starting to think, okay, we need a plan B. And for them, plan B involves changing essentially how heat moves through the earth's climatic system by engineering it. And so there's a few mechanisms that have been proposed for this. Uh, one that has received a good deal of attention is sometimes called solar geoengineering or solar radiation management. In the book, we use SRM, solar radiation management, but many people call it solar geoengineering. It's not entirely clear how this would work, but the basic idea would be to create human-induced Pinatubos. Mount Pinatubo was a volcano that erupted and lowered the Earth's mean temperature by putting so much uh, uh, sunlight blocking gases and particles in the Earth's atmosphere that essentially for a period of time, the total, the total amount of solar uh, radiation that stuck around in the Earth's system was significantly reduced. So we had about a one degree Celsius global reduction in mean temperature for several years. So that got people thinking about, well, could we create artificial Pinatubos by putting sunlight blocking particles <clears throat> into the Earth's atmosphere? And I'm no expert on this, uh, but my speculation, Varn, is that this will be tried. This will be tried. And uh, <clears throat> the reason I think it will be tried is because it's entirely consistent with the logic of capital and a sense among elites that something must be done. And of course, scientists will always be there <clears throat> who are willing to accept the grants and to try out their experiments on a planetary scale. Without going into detail about how this could work and what the negative consequences could be, I'll just make the following observation, which we elaborate on in the book, which is that whoever takes the step of beginning the, such an experiment of blocking the incoming radiation from the sun to the earth would be taking a step that is new, we think, in the history of the human relationship uh, that we call politics, because they would be asserting themselves as acting in the name of life on earth. They would therefore be acting in our terms as a planetary sovereign and saying to the world as a whole, essentially, hey, everyone, we need to do this. I'm making the decision. Let's do this, which is why there's a great deal of conversation right now within the community of people who discuss what they call the governance of solar geoengineering or radiation geoengineering, what they call governance. Governance discussions tend to center around questions like how could the decision to, to deploy SRM or solar geoengineering be done in a way that was moderately democratic, but also fast and consistent with the need to move quickly. <clears throat> Jeff and I are making a kind of lateral complement to this discussion by simply pointing out that <clears throat> to understand how that discussion is likely to unfold, we need a critique of the hegemony of capitalism and its liberal norms as well as a historical sensitivity to the form of sovereignty that has existed for a few hundred years. It goes by various names, but let's just say the existing form of sovereignty, which would, which would have to go through a decisive change if we adopted some kind of planetary arrangement whereby some very small subgroup of people was going to essentially set the thermostat for the world and determine when, to what extent, and where heat energy would enter the earth. Okay, this, that, that probably for some viewers just sort of got a bit abstract, but I hope it was clear, Varn. And, and in sum, in response to your question, finally, you see there are multiple possible pathways through which the world system could be shifting towards what we call planetary sovereignty. And therefore, it's difficult for us to say how this will play out. But what I think Jeff and I found very compelling and what we tried to express in our writing was that it's the... Most importantly, it's the coherence and the resonances, res, resonances, excuse me, and coherences between these multiple qualities that suggest this is the most likely path. It isn't a situation where, for instance, there are two or three reasons why this pathway is likely, but there's two or three 
which run counter to that. And so the outcomes are very contradictory. But rather what we see is a series of likely pathways which all point in one direction, but differently so. And needless to say, exactly how this will occur, I'm in no better position to predict than anyone else. We're simply trying to, if, if you would, alert the global left to this in, in, in the terms that we can use so that we have a, a stronger basis for which to reason through the present crisis. So a couple of things emerge listening to this, and they emerged when I read your book too. Um, and I, I first read your book about two years ago and came out in 2018. Um, I was going to ask you, though, uh, there are counter tendencies to this, and you do address them in the book. Um, one of the things that has uh, seemingly happened since 2020 is an acceleration of what looks like actually the decline of a lot of global orders. Um, has that affected uh, your thinking about this since you wrote this book? Uh, good question. So we, uh, thanks for reading the book, by the way. Uh, most of what we have to say in response to these sorts of questions is in chapter six of part two mm -hmm. of the book, which is called Planetary Sovereignty, which we wrote almost 10 years ago. <laughs> so uh, to reply to your question, perhaps I could take a, a short step back and explain the historical circumstances that led to our writing the book. And then um, that will help explain why I, I might date the phenomenon you're describing a little differently than you've proposed to 2020. Okay. So um, many of your viewers, I imagine, are in their 20s or 30s and probably came of age during the Obama years. So they may not recall, but when Barack Obama ran for president in the United States, he was uh, coming up after eight years of the presidency of George W. Bush, who, of course, represented fossil fuels in every sense. And uh, during a period in which the U.S. had, for all intents and purposes, pulled out of the international climate negotiations, and this was a terrible problem, of course, because the United States is the world's largest historical per capita emitter of fossil fuels, as well as at that time, the world's hegemon. And so it was very important for the international negotiations and the climate agreements that the United States get on board, so to speak. So when Obama was running for office, he, of course, made very clear statements to his would-be supporters that he was going to get the U.S. back on track. And he was duly elected in 2008. So coming into 2009, Obama was uh, inaugurated in January. And going into that November, December, we then had the next COP or UNFCCC meeting. Okay, from this point on, I'll just say the climate meetings, because that's easier for everyone to know. So we were having the big climate meetings, and that year it was going to be in Copenhagen. And so this was going to be the first big meeting after the election of Barack Obama. And there was tremendous enthusiasm really around the world, but of course, particularly in the United States, and I think to a certain extent in Europe, that the United States was back, had solid leadership, and was going to come to the table with a great deal. And that in some way, shape, or form, what we were going to get out of the Copenhagen meeting was going to look something like what later actually emerged many years later in Paris. It didn't happen. Copenhagen was something of a disaster. And it was a, a disaster for reasons I'd be happy to discuss. But to, to make a long story short, going into the meetings, there was a big groundswell of activism here and in Canada, where I live and where Jeff lives. And both of us were asked independently to come speak to audiences at events that were designed to kind of get people motivated prior to the Copenhagen, meet, Copenhagen meetings to express, uh, send a, a message to the government that they, they expected strong action on climate. And what Jeff and I said in parallel and separately on those two occasions, to put it very crudely, went something like this. We have to be careful about what we're asking for. If we send the world's capitalist elites off to a place like Copenhagen to design a new world order, and we do so because of urgency and emergency, and we just say, please fix this problem, we might end up with a solution we don't really want. So we have to think carefully. And Jeff made a statement to the crowd in Vancouver, which became something like our uh, our guiding star as we were beginning this project. And it, I think it just came to him because it was such a poetical line. He told the audience there, he said, we're either going to end up with a climate Leviathan or a climate Lenin. <laughs> 
And what he meant by that, to put it crudely, was we're either going to end up with a world in which the capitalist elites remain in power and accumulate even more power and change how they operate in order to manage global capitalism on their terms. And that's how we're going to, quote unquote, solve the climate crisis. Or we're going to have a kind of revolutionary global movement that changes how we live everywhere. And that's how we'll solve the climate crisis. Well, I didn't speak with such poetry, but I said something very similar on the steps of the Ohio State House here in Columbus, Ohio, almost to the day that Jeff said this. And then Copenhagen occurred and it was a disaster. And afterwards, Jeff and I were chatting on the phone and we were talking not only about what we said and what happened in Copenhagen, but reflecting on what I would characterize, Varn, as our dissatisfaction with what we had to say. We basically felt that we really didn't know how to explain not only how we saw the situation, but also how to communicate to other people the, the crisis we were in at that stage. And so we went through a kind of elaborate process of self-critique and reading and reflection on the crisis. And out of that, we came to the conclusion that having read it, I mean, copiously within the literatures on Marxism and climate and eco-socialism and the like, that while the left had achieved by that time a very clear and precise and persuasive critique of capitalism and climate change, it had not really dealt with the political dimensions of things, either on the political theory side or the geopolitics side. So we sensed that that was where we needed to go. Okay, so then in the midst of all that, the global financial crisis, or really it was a global capitalist crisis, but it's called the financial crisis, so I'll use that term, of 2000 to 2007 to 2009 was playing out. Now that crisis is, to return to your question, Varn, when I would date the beginning of the challenges to the rule of uh, the, the present hegemony of liberal order that you mentioned in your question. Although it is true that there have been some significant hits to liberalism and and its pretensions to global order in recent years, to my mind, the process really begins in the wake of that 2000, let's call it the 2008 economic crisis. For instance, although it is a long time ago, we can see extreme right-wing leaders who were establishing themselves on so-called populist basis popping up across uh, Europe in places like um, uh, Poland, Hungary, Italy with Berlusconi. And shortly in the wake of that, we saw, unless I, I won't mention all the dates here on video because I might get one wrong, but we saw Modi in India, who previously was regarded as a off the charts, extreme right wing uh, candidate. Uh, Shinzo Abe's rise in Japan had its own elements of extreme nationalism and extremism. Of course, uh, the Arab Spring came and went and the most important state in the region to undergo dramatic political change, Egypt, ended up with al-Sisi as its leader. Mm -hmm. In Turkey, Erdogan underwent a very interesting shift and became a right winger. The PAK uh, regime took power in South Korea in a, a, a pattern that was initially, I think, suggested had something to do with nostalgia for the old developmental state, authoritarian state days, but fits this global pattern all too well. And then, of course, Brexit and Trump and the rest of it. So this process, whatever we name it, most political scientists call it right wing populism, but I don't like that term because it doesn't really mean anything. I would prefer to call it authoritarian neoliberalism but even that's a bit vague. But whatever we call it, it arrives rather late here in the United States. But when, of course, when it does, the US being a kind of insular society says, oh my God, where did Trump come from when this global <laughs> process has been building for 10 years, right? So in, in, in short, Varn, to put this all very simply, too simply perhaps, uh, I think that Jeff and I would say that global capitalism has been in a crisis, which has been particularly intense since around 2008. And essentially what has happened is that the, the, the old style political economy that we'll remember from the early 2000s, basically US led global neoliberalism is clearly dying. But what will replace it is rather unclear. And there's a number of dynamics in play. The conflict, geopolitical conflict between the US and China. We're in an interregnum of history where there isn't one clear hegemon today. Uh, but the G2 are not playing well enough together to constitute a kind of new imperial global government either. They're almost on the brink of war at times, it seems. And then the global ecological crisis and the global capitalist crisis. So to put it simply in, in two words, we call this the triple crisis, a term that gets thrown around quite often among eco-socialists. My understanding 
Varn here, again, to put it simply, is that by triple crisis, we mean the following. On one hand, global capitalism has been in crisis for some time, particularly since 2008, which we can measure by declining rates of profit, uh, the, the very slow rates of growth, et cetera. A, a billion or so people locked out of formal labor markets with no ability to work their way into a gainful employment. In the second place, we have the ecological crisis manifested most, most, most profoundly by climate change, but also measurable by the great extinction we're living through and the destruction of uh, forms of land and water on every part of the world. What, what in my mind we see there is an interaction between those two where the, the easiest way to solve the economic crisis would be to accelerate economic growth through some old style Keynesian strategies, essentially making future generations pay for spending that we do now in order to stimulate rapid economic growth and using the state as kind of a global lever to straighten all this out. But any attempt today to increase the rate of growth in global capitalism would clearly make the second problem, the global ecological crisis, that much worse. And to solve the global ecological crisis, what we really need, of course, is to stop burning fossil fuels, which all things being equal would slow down the global economy some more. So this is a dual crisis. And the basic idea of the Green New Deal or Green Keynesianism is about engineering those two relationships so they work properly together. Now, here comes the kicker, though. That's not happening. We don't have global Green Keynesianism. And the elites, although they might be trying to create that scenario, are clearly not about to, to produce it. And in the meantime, in the midst of this global economic and ecological crisis, people everywhere are scared. They're fearful and they're suffering. And when people are afraid and suffering and people come along and tell them the problem is that guy down the road who's an immigrant or a Muslim or queer or what have you, for many people, those sorts of excuses and, and fear mongering is very compelling. And that is the explanation for why we see the political crisis, which is the third element of this crisis. The political crisis is, has emerged since 2008 because liberalism, in a word, has no solution to the dual crisis of economy and ecology. And so long as that persists, we should only expect to see more of these extreme right-wing capitalist, populist, authoritarian neoliberals. Um, one thing that I've noticed in the time period then since, since you're talking about, I, interestingly, you brought up both Korea and Egypt because during both of those transitions, I happened to be in both those countries. Get out of here. Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, and, and the Pak regime took power in Seoul. I left just before it took power during that election. And for moved, Egypt, for well, for for Mexico, then moved to Egypt after when the LCC regime consolidated power. You're you're you're, pra you're practically a world historical figure. <laughs> kind of funnily, I was. I literally lived across the street, well, down the street from the church that was bombed. The LCC used to reinstate the uh, the national security order that that originally was overthrown after being instated in the seventies. Wow. Um, uh, which was not a fun thing to live through. I'll, I'll say that. Um, but so when I came to admit when Trump was rising, I actually was like, I kept on telling people it's possible and it's not unique That's and, right. and get your head out your ass basically. But, people, but to generalize, I, I suspect people of your generation in the U S had a very hard time hearing you on that. Oh yeah. They, they, they did not hear me at all. Um, yeah. Yeah. and, uh, I, un unfortunately, you know, when, when, when I read your, your, your book, I, I was of two minds. You, you, the, the, the climate Leviathan does seem quite plausible to me, but, um, let's get to, to some other possibilities. So, Sure. Can I interrupt that thought for one second, Vern? Mm -hmm. So I thought I was about to get a criticism. So I was taking careful notes, but you stopped mm -hmm. short. But lay it on me. So you said climate Leviathan, the climate Leviathan seems plausible, but, and but. I think, I think the but is going to be, and, and let's just be candid because we've received a lot of criticism. We welcome it, but, but you're not convinced it's going to, it's going to happen. There could be even worse things that come along. Right. I, I've actually, I've actually kind of think the darkest scenario in your book is the most likely one right now. Okay. That's fine. Um, so we, we, we get that quite often. So, and, and, and Varn, you may be right. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what is uh, the reason why I, I said after 2020 um, is to me, 2020 is, is not 
is, is not a is not the defining moment, but it is like the defining. I, I, I'm going to call it an external shock, but that's not really what it is because you know um, pandemics are not external to the world system. <laughs> um, but it's it's a non political shock that seems to exacerbated certain already existing tendencies that you, I think you rightly chase trace all the way back to the end of the Bush administration. At you, minimum. you put it beautifully. I, I agree with that statement completely. Um, but I think a whole another thing that came to mind right now, though, and you 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 talked about it briefly in the beginning, um, is even on the left there has been a kind of methodological nationalism in the way that they approach these problems. Everything is always imagined at, at the at the level of the nation state because that is the only political lever people feel like they have. And as, you know, I think everybody who follows the climate debate realizes that's highly insignificant uh, are in that insufficient, insufficient in dealing with um, the climate crisis. It's also insufficient in dealing with the economic crisis. But but even Keynesian methodologies, our post-Keynesian methodologies of mon monetary theory, seem to be stuck in a nationalist mode of, of analysis. It, it's not that they're all political nationalists, that's not all the good that they see, but that's how they approach economies and how they approach ecologies and how they approach sovereignty and law. I totally, um, I totally agree with you. And we agree with you that this is a severe limitation on the left imagination. And of course, this is an old problem as you, we can go back to the 19th century and read uh, writings of leftists at that time howling about how the proletariat will continue to fail if it remains stuck in its nationalist ways of thinking. Uh, but the challenge in it today is greater for the left, because not only do we have to think in that, in the richest sense, as internationalists, which the left has at times achieved, right, to give ourselves some credit, there have always been some thinkers and activists who, who really did act in a profoundly internationalist sense. But in addition, complicating that internationalism, we now also have to be able to think as planetary thinkers, as human beings living through a fundamental transition of the human relationship to, to, to life on the planet. And to put it bluntly, Varn, the criticism you're making, to make it even more kind of uh, uh, candid and, 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 and severe, uh, we're failing on the left to, to produce the kind of thought and action that has those qualities. Hmm. And this is not a minor problem, which is why, look, I mean, Jeff and I, I I'd like to think, are, are not the kind of, I, I hope it doesn't come off this way. I don't, I don't like to think that we're the sort of arrogant guys who, who sit in rooms with lots of books and then come down from the mountain and say, this is what's happening. We're really trying to make a contribution to a very broad discussion so that the left collectively can think its way through this crisis. But what I would say, without any hesitation is that so far collectively we're failing to produce the kind of thinking and action we need. And so we desperately need more people to join this conversation, to think carefully and to develop more profound ways of, of analyzing these problems. Incidentally, to, to return to your counter hypothesis that Behemoth is the most likely scenario. Behemoth, for those who haven't read the book, would be a scenario whereby capitalism remains entrenched probably becomes even more powerful as a way of organizing the world, but that we, we do not see the, the emergence or the transcendence of the present order to something like planetary sovereignty. Well, that scenario is a, is a nightmare scenario farm, uh, because what that means is that we have what scientists call runaway climate change and uh, acceleration of the, of the, of the great die-off of species around the world. And an inability of capitalism to govern itself and a deepening of capitalist social relations. And the, in that scenario, war involving many countries probably is a near certainty. And that scenario is so bleak that I think it should remind us that we on the left really need to work hard now to increase the likelihood of some other scenario, because that is by far the worst scenario. And uh, I must say, Varn, you know, I've, I've taught this book a number of times, but I've also been teaching because I teach two classes each year 
here at Ohio State about climate politics, I've seen a shift in my students' thinking on this question just in the last two, three years. As recently as three to five years ago, I think most students believed that there would be some kind of global shift that would result in something like a climate leviathan. Mm -hmm. They weren't necessarily cheering for it, although I think, candidly, most of them were deep down if they, if they, if they were honest. But just in the last year, post-COVID, there's been a psychological shift at least among my students who are, you know, a very particular group, relatively privileged young people from Ohio, where many of them seem to have come to the conclusion that something like a BMLF-like scenario is most likely, and therefore they're, they're thinking about activism changes, so it becomes much more desperate. And in that thinking, the most logical thing for some of them is to commit acts of militant terrorism or attacks directly on fossil fuel infrastructure. And the book that resonates most powerfully for them, therefore, is not our book, it's How to Blow Up a Pipeline by our, our friend and comrade, Andreas Malm. I, I understand their attraction for that kind of thinking. I also, as a teacher and as a, as a person who's in this struggle with them, like to ask them follow-up questions. Like, let's think this through. Suppose politically we went out and started, you know, blowing up uh, gas pipelines. Under the present political arrangement, what would be the consequences? Would it spark a left-wing revolution that would bring about eco-socialism? To which, of course, invariably they immediately say, no, of course not. So then, if that's what we're fighting for, how do we achieve that? To which, of course, they will say, I I'm making a huge generalization, but play along with me, that they say, I don't know, and therefore, the only thing we can do is go blow something up. And it seems to me, Varn, that much as I understand that line of thinking, I would like to insist that it's inadequate and it's not good enough. We have to do better than that. We have to come up with better collective answers to these difficult questions. I, that always brings to me the old uh, uh, kind of emblematic tale for, for leftists of Lenin and Lenin's brother. Uh, Lenin's brother being the the semi-anarchist terrorist and Lenin's critique of him being that it that these actions actually accelerate the kind of politics that you are fighting against because they bring in repression um and and they do not necessarily create the collective unity you need to fight that repression and so um that's that's always my immediate thought when we, when we talk about uh that kind of direct action is like well is that direct action in an actually productive towards what you're doing or is it letting off frustration in a desperate mode of which you are maybe even accelerating the thing that you are fighting against? That's, and, that's, that's a beautifully put Varn. And that question should always be asked. And it's very hard to make generalizations. Look, I am pro direct action. Me too. Yeah. No question <laughs> about it. There's no, there's no, there's no doubt that we need a thousand forms of direct action here and now, but that direct action has to be coupled with strategy or else it will not produce the collective outcomes that we want. It will just hurt people and produce a reaction. And so, sorry, back to you, Varn. So I was going to ask you a question though. You mentioned uh, uh, Jeff had originally come up with climate linen, but in the book, it shifts to climate Mao. That's right. Um, uh, what caused that shift? <laughs> Uh, there are good. Thank you. There are a couple reasons for that. Um, partly, to be frank, it was we wanted to get outside of the typical rut of what are usually called Western academic market Marxist conventions mm -hmm. of always going back to the same old thinkers. And uh, but there were there were other reasons too. It wasn't it wasn't just a critique of Eurocentrism, if I could put it that way. Although admittedly that was a factor. Like we had to stop at some point and say why Lenin? Why Lenin? Uh, when we were still thinking that we were going to remain within the framework of what is usually called Western political philosophy and its tradition, we came to the conclusion pretty early on that Robespierre rather than Lenin would have would have been a, a, a better representative, so to speak, of that position for reasons I could discuss, but your readers probably, your listeners may know. And so for a while, that square, the bottom left square said climate Robespierre. And apparently someone recently wrote a paper called Climate Robespierre fending for that position. So they know they summed up what we were thinking that would look like. So, uh, but we turned instead to Mao for a couple of reasons. One of them is 
a simple demographic fact, Varn, which is that so far as I can tell, if you look at all the people in the world today who are considered Marxist, like who would actually call themselves Marxists of some form or another, or communists or socialists, it's my understanding that there are more Maoists than any other type of Marxist. So yeah, there are like academic Marxists in places like the United States making, making blogs and there's Marxists in Cuba and there's Marxists here and there. But when you look at East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and you start to count up all of the Maoists there, there's just simply more of them than anywhere else. But what's curious is that they almost never get discussed in anything like a, a serious, let alone sympathetic way by anyone in the West. In fact, they're often treated as like idiots or dupes who re should receive no concern whatsoever. And to, to my mind, that is a problem and probably a reflection of the history of Orientalism and so forth and so on. But moreover, there's also a deeper reason here, which is that when we look at the world today as geographers and we look at the excellent research that has been conducted on where the people in the world are who are presently suffering the consequences of climate change, although people often tend to think about the Caribbean, for instance, or Africa gets thrown around a lot because, quote unquote, Africa, uh, for those listeners who are listening to this and not seeing it, I'm making scare quotes around Africa. Okay, the idea here is that Africa becomes a stand-in for disaster. It's not really a differentiated space where people distinguish like between say Egypt and Ethiopia and, and Kenya and so forth, which of course one must do because they're very different societies, as you know. So, however, the, the facts are this, Varn, by far the greatest number of people in the world who are already suffering the consequences of climate change are in Asia, in, in a region that stretches essentially from Pakistan and Afghanistan to Korea and down through Southeast Asia, including Indonesia. There are literally billions of people in that region, billions with a B, who are already directly experiencing severe consequences of climate change. And there will, of course, be many more in the future as the Pacific and the Indian Oceans warm, as climate patterns change, as both droughts and floods become more frequent and severe, and on and on we go. And demography is not everything, okay? We're not Malthusians, but we are geographers. And for geographers, those sorts of facts matter. And therefore we had to ask ourselves a question, which I think too many people in places like the US don't ask, which is if a world political economic transformation comes about in the next 20 or 30 years, let's say, in Asia, and Marxism is part of it, what sort of Marxism is most likely to come to the fore? And Varna, I just don't think there's much doubt that Maoism of some form, and as you know, there are many, yep. will be an important part of that story. So it behooves us to pay a little attention to it. Lastly, there's a kind of a acute theoretical point, which is that to the extent that the, the man whose name is Mao Zedong contributed anything as a philosopher to the history of Marxism, it was essentially in his conviction that Karl Marx was wrong, that the proletariat was this a distinct social class who was going to bring about the end of capitalism. Against this, Mao asserted, and then one could say, I suppose, proved, although that's debatable, through the revolution itself, that any social class that was exploited could play a significant role in the overthrowing of capitalism. And for him, the lower peasants and the middle peasants were potentially just as revolutionary as the urban proletariat. Now, one could say, well, of course, Mao came to that conclusion because the proletariat was wiped out by his opponents. Perhaps. But then again, one could ask, maybe Marx was wrong. Maybe the proletariat is a distinct social class that defines capitalism, but that doesn't necessarily mean that politically it is bound to become the revolutionary subject that he called it to be. And some of our friends and comrades on the left have taken issue with this in the book and have essentially asserted back against these ideas, Lenin's name. So for instance, just, just to name one person, there have been quite a few who have said something along these lines. But perhaps the most prominent is Jody Dean. I think it would be fair to call uh, or to characterize as a, a, a Marxist-Leninist. Yep. Jody Dean has criticized our books on the ground that we didn't affirm climate Leninism. Andreas Malm has said something similar, but without, perhaps because he was being polite, without saying, I disagree with Wainwright and Matt. So I certainly have respect for my colleagues who are trying to call for climate Leninism. But nonetheless, I, I would stick to the answer we came, came to in the book and for the reasons I've just explained. And I would put back to my comrades on the left, 
why why are you so sensitive about using the term climate Maoism? I, it's an interesting question. Like, why do you insist on going back to Lenin? And I don't think, I, I, this is a hypothesis. I may be completely wrong. I don't think it's because my friends on the left believe that the practices and thoughts of the man named Vladimir Lenin, such as were executed in the 1910s, are directly useful for bringing about a revolution in Ohio today. I just don't think that's why they're doing it. I think there has to be some deeper reason, and I'd be curious to hear what it is. One of the interesting things that occurs to me about that is even in the case of Lenin, Lenin's uh, dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry um, was already a, a shift from classical Marxist thinking that he had to justify. Um, you know, but I think that that it, that in and of itself, um, I always I always talk about that because I'm like uh, Maoism is the most, I think, series of thinkers and and, and I, my when I read I'm glad you clarified that there's multiple kinds of Maoism because oh yes um, I'm like yeah yeah a dungist a limbalist a third worldist and a classical Maoist agree on about as much as I mean they honestly. They almost agree nothing, but <laughs> how about within how about within the inner circle within China, circa 1968? How much was agreed upon? Uh, yep. Right. No, it's both, so both Dung and the Gang of Four have legitimate claims to Maoism. What's that? Both Dung and the Gang of Four have legitimate claims to Maoism. So. Exactly. Exactly. But then again, <laughs> as we say in the book, and we're not trying to be cute, you know, we tend to think of people like. When we talk about the French Revolution, we tend to think about people like Danton and Robespierre. Mm -hmm. But if you understand the whole historical process, you have to include Napoleon, mm -hmm. right? It's not so. So, I think the question could be raised: Why give a name? Why use a proper name at all? You know, why Lenin? Why Robespierre? Why Mao? Why not just call it revolutionary responses that produce planetary sovereignty? And the answer to that, of course, is that would be perfectly fine. But we needed one word because that's what we had for all the other squares. And we were trying to give short, as it were, marketable, clear t tags to these things. And Mao seemed to fit the bill. And I don't, I don't regret it, despite the fact that it's caused a lot of people discomfort. Varn, to be candid with you, among the academic crowd that we hang out with, because we're not just, you know, activists and, you know, people who mm -hmm. talk on blogs, but we, we go to scholarly discussions too. The, the, the use of the, the discussion of Mao and Maoism has basically been treated so negatively, dismissively. And I, that's another reason why I, I don't want to back down from it. Is I, I, I'm very uncomfortable with what I would characterize as the progressive liberal refusal to engage with the Maoist tradition to core. Uh, I, I would, would agree with that. And it's... Um, if anything, right now, I, I even worry that people who think in the West that they're upholding a Maoist tradition have a too simplified view of it because of also because of Orientalism, non-exposure, not not being uh, only encountering it in, in in media and you know even in Chinese media in English, it's still it it's still very limiting. Um, one one thing that is interesting, we haven't got the climate X, and that's going to be my my last my last uh, question because that's the, the hopeful side good but um uh i think uh i think except for for behemoth all of your scenarios even a little bit climate x you are ambivalent about uh like when i say ambivalent i don't mean indecisive i mean there you, there are two minds of which emerging uh behemoth is 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 unequivocally bad like that, yeah, no, there's uh, nothing, there's nothing redeemable there. We have right. nothing good to say about that. But uh, I think, you know, you don't, the book doesn't devote that much time to climate. Now I will also point out fair, um, fair, fair criticism. Um, but uh, what are the ambivalences there? What are the two tendencies that you see there? In some ways it seems slightly more hopeful than even Leviathan, although a little bit less, a lot less likely in some ways. But um, when I think about wh where's getting hit by climate change, and I point this out to people, uh, even on the left who are, who are big fans of China, where I'm like, yeah, but China is gonna get disproportionately hit by climate change. India already is. That's correct. 
I mean, we have birds falling out of the sky in India and half of the wheat plot failing. Like it's, 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 it's kind of apocalyptic there already. Um, and, uh, but so what are the, what are the kind of the two sides of the coin there on climate Mal? Like, oh, what, I thought you were going to say, what are the two sides of the coin on apocalypse? I was like, well, no, no, there's no two sides of the coin. Apocalypse is bad. <laughs> apocalypse is bad. Uh, for, for the, for the record, for the viewers, whenever we discuss this book, the A word apocalypse gets thrown around. And I, I get that. It's not a, it's not a word that we use in the book, uh, because of its, um, it, 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 what we would characterize as its negative biblical overtones. Mm -hmm. I mean, once you're speaking of apocalypse, then you are securely on a theological mm. discussion and you are implicitly appealing for gods or a God to bring about the salvation. And um, I don't think we want to go there, Varn. So I hope that doesn't sound like I'm quibbling with. I take your point, though, that to put it more uh, uh, objectively, the situation for poor people in, in South Asia today is so dire. I mean, people are dying in large numbers from heat stress, which isn't even an issue that we used to think about. Heat stress as in the body becoming routinely over hot. But this is inevitable in, in a world where urban areas are frequently reaching temperatures of 35, 40, and 45 degrees Celsius, which is, of course, certain to be much more likely in years ahead. Not only in India, where it's been receiving attention, but Again, in Indonesia, the Philippines, China, and so on, which are, of course, societies. I just named three of the most populous countries in the entire world. Mm -hmm. Right. So the mind reels. We have no I think we have no historical analog for this fact, Farn. We are entering a period where enormous aggregations of human beings on the scale of literally billions of people are living in areas where the existing forms of livelihood could become periodically untenable and where the capitalist state has no means to resolve this problem in the short term in that space. And the question this poses, of course, which should be on the front of everyone's mind, but particularly people like political scientists who seem to be avoiding it as best they can, is what is the likely political response to that situation? And I think the liberal response, the, the liberal mindset seems to be to think, well, those billions of people will just roll over and die. And what Jeff and I are saying is, no, that is unlikely, actually. So what is more likely is there will emerge mass-based social movements demanding radical social change. But they will come about, of course, in ways that are fundamentally shaped by the existing conception of the world of the people of that region, which means, of course, we're going to see a lot more religious movements, but also political movements in places like China that go back and try and revive some aspect or another of the Maoist tradition. We'll, we'll be interested to see what that might be, which raises now to your question. So what's wrong with climate Maoism or climate Leninism for that matter? Well, let's just say that I can definitely understand why many people believe on the left that it's superior to uh, climate Leviathan. And in a way, I agree with them. Uh, I certainly agree with them because it's anti-capitalist. It's trying to produce a a non-capitalist socialist world. And it's in incomparably better than Behemoth, which is a disaster. The fatal flaw though of that scenario is that it, it, it amounts to this, adopting forms of planetary sovereignty in the name of saving life on earth and the people, absent anything like democratic procedures, democratic capacities. Because there's no way in my mind, we're going to see a radical anti-capitalist global movement take power and reorganize life on earth quickly, which is also democratic, even remotely, by any definition. And so we immediately come back to the great debates of the 20th century, of uh, how it could be that a thinker like Marx, who was by our reading, a radical Democrat, who basically hated the state, could have been converted into the patron saint of various forms of authoritarianism. Is there any way out? So this brings us to the, the concept of climate X, which is basically a concept, as, as many have pointed out. It's very uh, uh, vague in the conclusion of our book. And that often frustrates um, our students, for instance, who like clear answers. So to begin with, 
a simple statement. If we were to define a climate X future formulaically, this would be a scenario where on one hand, the global left had unified and gained enough power to overcome global capitalism and created something like a socialist alternative. And in the second place, it had overcome the ecological crisis and climate change in a way that was fundamentally democratic, not in the sense of involving procedures which are recognizably democratic in the form of liberal capitalist societies necessarily, but in the arguably more fundamental sense that power was actually distributed in a way that was not confined either by what is likely under planetary sovereignty or under the existing forms of sovereignty. In other words, not bound up with the forms of sovereignty we associate with the capitalist, liberal, democratic, territorial nation state for the last few hundred years. In some, climate X is a path whereby we simultaneously overcome all the dimensions of the triple crisis, economic, ecological, and political, simultaneously. It is such a tall order, Varn, that it is very difficult for Jeff and I to say anything about what this looks like meaningfully that um, doesn't sound totally utopian. But perhaps just to end with this utopian image, I'll share the following, which is that I think that it's very important that we allow ourselves to think in utopian ways today in the face of the crisis, if for no other reason than as a kind of psychological strategy to contend with the the, the critical thinking that leads us to the conclusion that Biamonth is coming. Because it takes a very particular kind of mind to come to the conclusion that the world is going to hell in a handbasket and yet remain totally cool and calm and operate effectively from day to day. And even those people might not be very healthy deep down. So it, not to sound, I, I hope, too therapeutic, but what I'm suggesting is that the left needs a strategy for dealing with the fact that we are staring into a very deep crisis with the triple crisis. And one strategy is to allow ourselves the right and insist upon the right to make utopian demands. And one of those utopian demands we suggest should be that we demand a future which is not capitalist and overcomes the present day form of sovereignty and which can generate through that process a radically democratic response to the triple crisis today. And that's what we mean by, by climate X. And because uh, we don't want to give it a name because any name could be debatable, we simply leave it as X because X is, of course, the unknown to be solved for. That's the challenge we face today. I hope that isn't too vague. And regrettably, Varn, I'm out of time, but I hope yeah. this was, a, I, I enjoyed the conversation and I thank you again for reading our work and for your excellent questions. Thank you. Um, everyone should check out uh, your book, I think Climb of Ice, and I do think it's important. Um, it and Andrea's Mom are the two books I always tell people to start with, and then I tell them to go back and read the other eco-socialist literature. Um, and- Well, thank you for your recommendations, Varn. Yeah, so uh, that's why I wanted to have you on the show. Um, anything that you, any, is there any uh, additional writings uh, on this that you have coming out that people may find? Uh, Jeff and I have written a number of essays since completing the book, which have been published here and there. Uh, but to be, and, and I might recommend one or the other for different reasons for different people, but to be frank with you, I think all of the conversations we've had since then have convinced me that what we said that was essentials in the book. So okay. I would point people to the book. All yeah. right. Mainly, well, mainly we've been working on, on other matters. So Mm -hmm. not about this stuff yeah um you work a lot on d on on decolonial uh mm -hmm. um writings i know I, you're an, another book by you that i have not read but it's actually on my list is uh, decolonizing development right so, that was my first book uh and um back in the 90s i was part of i think along with you what used to be called the anti-globalization mm -hmm. movement and we used to knock our heads around about how the idea of development had been captured by capitalism. And then of course, the US invasion of Iraq uh, after 9-11 and Afghanistan as well was uh, happening when I was in graduate school. We were all reading Marxism with post-colonial theory. So my dissertation and my first book were essentially a study of how the British colonized the Southern part of Belize and Central America, the ancestral homelands of the Chol, Kikchi and Mopan Maya people. So it's partly, a historical work based on archival research, but also a study 
of the operation of colonial power through development up to the present day. So that was that was where my work began. And I've continued to work in Southern Belize and I've been working in Belize now steadily for almost 30 years. I was just back again uh, last week and uh, I'm presently writing a new critical history of Belize with Belize's great socialist and historian, Asad Schumann. And we hope to finish that book in 2023. After that, my next book is going to be on Marx and natural history. So returning to themes from the last section of Climate Leviathan, another attempt to try to think and write clearly about the major crisis of our times and explicitly turning to the writings, the late writings of Marx to make sense of it. Right. Oh, we'll see. I haven't written that one yet, so we'll have to see. Fingers crossed. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you for coming on. Yeah, and have a great day. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Take excellent care. Farewell to your listeners.